We're going through Ephesians because it's just a wonderful book. And I want to remind you that the, the big picture of the book of Ephesians is that God formed the church by his grace and love. It was all by his sovereign purposes. Before the foundation of the world, it was his design that Jesus would die, that he would bring to himself a people that would become his glorious body, his, his church, his bride. But he formed it by his love. But in 4 through 6, we're learning that the church is to function for his glory. It's not just, okay, you're, you're saved. Come as you are, you're saved. That's true. But it's now come as you are and be transformed by the gospel. Be changed into the image of Christ. And so the second half of the book is about our Christian walk. The word walk is repeated four times in the second half of the book, and it's obviously a metaphor for how we live our lives. But, but we have to remember this, that our walk has to be grounded in the gospel. It's not just clean up your act and change. It's because, as Pastor John shared a couple weeks ago in chapter 4, Paul says, don't walk like the Gentiles because you have been created as a new person in the image of God. And so now God is bringing out from within us the transformation that the gospel produces. And so Pastor Austin shared with us a series of areas like anger and falsehood and our words and our speech and love. And then last week, Pastor Jeremy reminded us that we're to imitate God but how important it is, he says, to don't let this immorality or impurity of these godless ways infiltrate your life because that's not who we are. We're light in the Lord. And more than ever in American culture, we're finding that people who profess to be Christians aren't living that way. And as a result of that, there's, there's a weakness, there's a lack of influence that as A.W. Tozer said, the reason there aren't more Christians in America is because of Christians in America. And so Paul was very careful in discipling Christians to encourage them that because of God's grace in their lives, they're to be changed. They're to live differently. And so Pastor Jeremy ended last week with verse 14, where he, he reminded believers that as we call out and, and have nothing to do with the deeds of darkness, but expose them, that this can awaken people. They can rise from the dead. As a result of that, this morning we're going to look at verses 15 through 21, and we're going to see that Paul's going to use three contrasts, a good way to teach things. Don't be like this. Be like this. You know, don't waste your time. Use your time wisely. Don't be dumb. Be smart. Don't be lazy. Be hardworking. So three contrasts where he's going to remind us of the work of the gospel in our lives. So let's pray. And then let the Lord speak to us. Father, may the Holy Spirit now take the word that you have given us. And may he feed us. May he open our eyes and point us to Jesus. As we read this passage, may it be what you said it is. Alive and powerful, encouraging, convicting, comforting, strengthening, equipping us. I know I needed to hear this passage. And I'm sure we all do in one way or another. So we thank you for meeting with us and look forward to the Spirit's power. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to read together verses 15 through 21, if you want to follow along on the screen. He says, therefore, now that, that's in light of this change, we're going to try to call unbelievers to Christ by not being like them. Be careful how you walk. Now here's the first contrast. Not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time. Why? Because the days are evil. So then, here's the next contrast. Don't be foolish. But what's the contrast to foolish? Don't be foolish, caring less about what God thinks, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And then the third contrast, don't be under the influence of alcohol. Do not get drunk with wine. If we can change the thing. Oh, we're missing a slide. Do not get drunk with wine for, is there, is there not a slide for that one? 
It should say, for that is dissipation. I guess we're missing a portion. That's all right. Let me just read it from, from the Bible here. It says in verse 18, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now you can put that last slide back up. It was just missing one verse. But be filled with the Spirit. So we'll, we'll look at verse 19. It says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father. And then he says, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So let's start back at verse 15. The first thing I think Paul's going to remind us is that we need to use our time wisely. Use our time wisely. As a Christian, we are called to a self-reflective life. So he says, be careful how you walk. In other words, regularly think about your passions, your pursuits, your use of time, your, your values, the things you read, things you watch on television, how much time on Facebook, how much time on social media, how much time with my kids, how much time with work. Just, just pause regularly and, 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 and be careful. This is a, a, a theme that goes through scripture. In Deuteronomy, God said to his people, as Moses was about to take them to the edge of the promised land, he said, Deuteronomy 4, 9, take heed to yourself. Keep your soul diligently so that you don't forget the things your eyes have seen and that they depart from your heart. But teach them to your sons and your sons' sons. So, so just kind of keep a watch on your life. Be thinking about the word. In Proverbs, Solomon said it this way. He said, watch over your heart with all diligence. Because out of your heart flows the issues of life. And so as you think about it, think of your heart as like this this organism that's desiring, it's looking, it's wanting, it's moving in directions. And, and it often sees something and says, that will make me happy. That's what I want. That's what I should do. So he goes, watch over your heart with all diligence. In Hebrews 12, the author was afraid that some of the Christians had grown bitter. So he said, you need to really look diligently so that you don't fail of the grace of God, lest a root of bitterness springs up and troubles you, and many are defiled. So, so watch yourself that you don't become bitter. Paul told his, his young disciple Timothy, he said in 1 Timothy 4.16, pay close attention to yourself and to your doctrine. In other words, watch your behavior and watch your beliefs. He said because... As you persevere in these things, you will ensure salvation, not just for yourself, but for those who hear you. So it's just a good reminder as we begin this new year, be careful how you walk. Just, just stop and think, okay, am I, am I being cautious and introspective and not morbid, but just evaluating my decisions? Now, in contrast to that, he says, not as a, an unwise man. Now, generally in, in scripture, a wise person, the, the biggest picture of a wise person is a person who orients their life around God. In other words, Proverbs 1, 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So a wise person, I was uh, Zooming with the Van Loos last night, and we were talking about when you wake up, how soon do you think about the Lord when you wake up? Is he your first thought as, 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 as you come back to consciousness? Do you, do you think to yourself, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you. Terry said, I, I always say, thank you for a good night's sleep. And I go, well, what if it's at three o'clock in the morning? I go, Lord, please let me go back to sleep. But ask yourself, how long into your day before the Lord's even on your screensaver? Do you think about him? So, so he says, walk as a wise person. And, and there's a broad arena of ways that wisdom shows up in our lives. And you could go through Proverbs to learn that. But I think he's more specific here when he talks about being wise because he says, be wise. And then he tells us, 
making the most of your time. So that's why I said, probably the big picture here is using your time wisely. There's other areas of wisdom. The word making the most is an interesting word. It's only used twice in the New Testament. It literally means to buy back. Buy back your time. It's used in, in Daniel chapter 2 in the Septuagint when, when the king says, I'm going to kill all you people if you don't figure this out. And, and Daniel says, we need more time. And, and the king says, I know what you're trying to do. You're stalling. You're trying to buy some time. Remember on Wheel of Fortune, you want to buy a vow. What, what would that look like to, to buy back time? I wish I could buy back time. I'd go way back, wouldn't you? And go, man, alive if I could buy back time. No wonder David said, remember not the sins of my youth. So I don't think the idea is that we can go back and redeem the time. As Chuck just shared with us, we have to forget what lies behind. But now, and I think this is a good translation, make the most of your time. But you know what's interesting? The only other place that Paul uses this word is in the context of relationships with unbelievers. He says in, listen to this verse, Colossians 4, 5, conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, buying back or making the most of the opportunity. So, probably what Paul has in mind here, he has just said, you know, don't be like unbelievers. Be different. Be loving. Be holy. Be sacrificial. Don't talk. Eat. Don't let garbage come out of your mouth. Be full of praise. And as they're watching you, make the most of your time. And I thought, well, well what would that look like if, if what Paul has in mind here is using your time wisely, particularly in regards to evangelism. Well, I thought about this. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul said, I'm free from all men, but I have made myself a slave to all men so that I might win them. So as you think about your 168 hours that you have in each week, can you, do you carve out time to purposefully develop relationships with unbelievers. You're like, you know, I don't have time for that. I mean, it's a mindset that the Holy Spirit develops within us that says, if people are going to come to Christ, and 80% of people that come to Christ come through friends or family members, it's got to be, I'm, I'm carefully using my time to invest it in trying to reach people, which means... Yeah, I could take my buddy to the ball game, but, but could I take an unbeliever? So sometimes when I'm, for example, I like to play tennis. I'll think to myself, hey, you know, let me, let me call up this brother, this brother. I play with some of the brothers from church. But sometimes I'll just go, you know what? I need to call this guy because he's not a believer. Let me hang out with him. Let me play tennis with him. Let me build that relationship. And the other day I was talking to this one guy and he brought up the Lord. So I don't, I don't think Paul's strictly talking about evangelism here, but I think that's an important part. But then he tells us why. Now, don't miss. Well, why do I need to be so careful with my time? He goes, because the days are evil. You're like, wait a minute. That was back then. He ain't seen nothing, right? So there's a couple ways that commentators have reflected on this. They've said either what he means here is there's a lot of persecution that's coming. But I don't think that's his main point. I think that was true in 1 Corinthians 7. He said, because of the times right now, it's probably a good idea to stay single. But I think what he means here is more morally. He, he and his culture was looking and saying, we live in a morally corrupt time. Now, has that ever been the case that that's not true? Galatians 1.4 says, Christ died to deliver us from this present evil age. Philippians, in in, in the book of Philippians, Paul says, we shine as lights holding forth the word of life in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. But I think the Bible also teaches that in the progress of history, things will get worse. So frequently scripture will say, in the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self. 
claiming a form of godliness, but there's no power to it. Lovers of pleasure, lovers of money, evil, and so forth. And so I thought to myself, as, as we look around at our culture and we go, oh my word, and you know, you're, you're, you're thinking of your political position and, and what's going to happen, right? Well, the reality is it's unlikely that things are going to get better because the Bible tells us the days are evil. But I thought Matthew Henry had a really interesting thing. He said, you know, when, when, when we think about evil times, we don't know how soon they're going to be worse. He said, people are very apt to complain of bad times, right? I can't believe the, these people. Blah, blah, blah. But then he says this, instead of complaining about bad times, let, every time you think about bad times, let it stir you to use your time wisely, right? I need to be careful of my time because I'm living in evil times. And instead he's going, oh, the government, you, wow, more than ever, let me, what can I, can I pray more? Can I invest in people more? Even here he mentioned, Henry mentioned, investing as Christian parents, taking care to improve your family, watching against temptations, doing good while it's in the power of your hands. Our time is a gift from God and, and we must double our diligence for the future. So the first part he tells us is, you know, be careful. Take an take a introspective look over this past year and as you move forward, I totally agree with Chuck. Don't make all these promises to God. I'll never say a bad word. You know, I'll always submit to my husband. I'll never yell at the kids. Don't make all these pledges and vows, but just surrender to the Lord and say, Lord, just help me to watch carefully on my time. So that's the first thing. The second thing Paul's going to do in the second contrast is he's going to tell us not only to use our time wisely, but secondly, to make God's will our priority. Look at verse 17. Here's the next contrast. So then, do not be foolish. It's a little bit different from first contrast, wise and unwise. This time, it's foolish, but instead of saying, be wise, this time he says, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I want to start with that phrase, don't be foolish. The book of Proverbs is probably the, the finest book to describe a fool. A fool is someone who, who carelessly goes about with disregard of God. And it shows up in all kinds of ways. It shows up in laziness. It shows up in pride. It shows up in argumentativeness. There's some wonderful Proverbs. You know, we all know people who are know-it-alls. The Bible says, a fool is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can give a good answer, you know. It talks about a fool is always making excuses for his laziness. A fool won't listen. A fool won't receive correction. As I went through some of the scriptures, there are some examples in scripture of people who acted foolishly. For example, David one time numbered the people, even though God didn't want him to do that. And it says in Numbers 20, or 2 Samuel 24, Lord, I've sinned greatly. Please forgive me. I acted very foolishly. So his pride and self-reliance was a sign of foolishness. What about when things go bad? When things go bad in your life, do you get mad at God and complain? It's what happened to Job, right? His wife says, just curse God and die. And what did Job say to her? He said, he said to her, and I don't think he was mad at her. He said, you speak as a foolish woman. So a mark of foolishness is when we get mad and blame God. It's foolish when we doubt God's word and we all do it. Jesus said to the disciples in Luke 24, you foolish men and slow of heart to believe. And then the one that I think we all find ourselves guilty of, when we first embrace the gospel, we know it's all by grace. We trust in God and we thank him so much for saving us. But then we can, we can get off the horse of grace and get onto the horse of performance. I'm pretty sure, pretty soon we're trying to earn God's favor. I'll read my Bible more and somehow I, I equate that you know, this is a good day because I had my devotions. If you've never read Jerry Bridges' book about the grace of God, the discipline of grace, a wonderful book to remind you, don't move away into legalism. Paul said to the Galatians, you foolish Galatians, what happened? You received the Spirit by faith, but now you're trying to be perfected by the flesh. 
Even something as practical as this. I remember my young nephew, who, who was a pastor, but as a young man, I remember him telling me he had a big poster of a Porsche in his, in his house, and he said, I want to grow up and be a dentist so I can have a Porsche. Is that wrong? No. But 1 Timothy 6 says, those who want to get rich fall into temptations and many foolish and harmful desires. So the contrast here is don't be foolish, but then he says, understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, that's difficult. I, I had to do some study on that word because I'm like, we all want to understand what the will of the Lord is. I could save you a ton of time. In 1 John 5, it says, if you pray anything in his will, he'll answer you. Well, understanding what the will of the Lord is is not a one-time thing. This word understand has the idea of grasping, thinking, comprehending. And I think it's probably best illustrated back in verse 10 when he says, we're trying to learn how to please the Lord. The Christian life is an ongoing thank you note. But as Christians, the will of the Lord should be our priority. When I say to God, thy will be done, primarily I'm talking about me and him and his word. So ask yourself, am I really thinking deeply about the will of the Lord in my own life? And there's a lot of subjectivity to this. It's not just, okay, 1 Thessalonians 4 says, don't be immoral, don't fornicate, for this is the will of God that you abstain from fornication. But there's a lot of gray areas. And so Paul prayed for the Colossians. God, fill us with the knowledge of your will, with all wisdom, so that we can please you in every respect. So uh, what I mean by prioritizing the will of God is just thinking as you're going through the day, praying and as you're reading, is this pleasing to you, Lord? What, what change, you know, what's, what's the best thing that I can do as I choose a career, buy a house, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm prioritizing wanting to do God's will. This is really Romans 12 too. Romans 12, 1, present yourself to God, but then he says, be transformed so that you can prove what the will of God is. It's not a one-time thing where God goes, here's all my will, but we're focusing on the will of God. So I'm using my time wisely instead of being unwise. I'm making God's will a priority instead of being a fool. And then finally, the third thing is, I'm going to learn to be under the influence. You're like, wait, under the influence, and it's another contrast. It's a contrast between being under the influence of alcohol versus being under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So look at verse 18. It says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. Now, when it comes to the subject of alcohol, we could go on and on, and I don't have time to do that, but there are warnings all over the New Testament and Old Testament about how dangerous alcohol is. Not forbidden, but one must approach it with great caution. For drunkenness has dragged many souls into eternal perdition. And so if in any way alcohol is, 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 is beginning to master you, then flee from it, refrain from it. Drunkenness is clearly outside the will of God. And, and rather than push the limit and say, did I reach point, 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 point? We need to all exercise great caution because when you're under the influence of alcohol, nothing good comes out of that. People make terrible decisions. Women and men's lives are often permanently scarred by poor decisions. But what's interesting is that in that culture, the, the, the Greeks, and, and I read this in a commentary, it said they had a, a ceremony called bakalanya. And so I had to look it up in Wikipedia. I'm like, what is that? And, and it actually was a, a ceremony that they had. And, and one of the things, they would have drunkenness and sexual immorality, but it said, in ancient practices, this is from Wikipedia, most of their ritual rites included singing hymns and dancing, sacrifice and libations. So I think in the context, Paul was probably going, don't be going to these parties and drinking and carousing, you know, much like, I hate to say this, but sometimes when you're watching a sporting event and it's 20 degrees below and there are people with no shirt on, oh, 
you just kind of wonder, hmm, wonder what's influencing that behavior. You know, when, when you watch a soccer game, right, and they're all singing, well, it doesn't mean they're all drunk, but we understand that the idea of carousing and partying and Christmas parties and college campuses and the number one party school, that's common. So Paul says, don't be like that for that's, he says, dissipation. And this word dissipation is, is an interesting word. It has the idea of being out of control, wasteful. It's translated riotous living. It's used of the prodigal son when it says he, he, he used his his father's stuff wastefully. He just blew it all, right? So anytime Christians are out of control, that's a good thing to unbelievers. Let's party, get out of control. And God's going, no, no, no. Don't be under the influence of alcohol. But instead, look at the contrast. He says, be filled with the Spirit. And I've kind of had a change of views on this after reading O'Brien's commentary. I generally felt like the point here is you're filled with the content of the Holy Spirit. Like, let him, we're all indwelled by the Spirit, but let him fill you more. But I think O'Brien's right in suggesting this, that the the idea here is not the content that you're filled with, but the manner by which you're filled. Be filled by the Spirit. Which then causes you to go back and say, what does he mean by be filled? Well, he, he's already told us. Back in chapter 3, he said, I pray that you'll know the love of Christ to be filled to the fullness of God. In chapter 4, he said, the goal of the church is that we come to the fullness of the measure of Christ. So when he says be filled, it's the idea of being filled with the life of God, oriented around Christ, being transformed into his image. Well, how's that going to happen? By the Spirit. So you say, well, Pastor, why did you tell me to be under the influence? I did. But not of alcohol. Of the Spirit. Well, how do I put myself under the influence of the Spirit? Well, there's a couple things. Number one, I have to be conscious of the Spirit's work in my life and praying about that. Lord, lead me by the Spirit. But but the human element of that is the Word of God. So there's a very close parallel to this passage in Colossians 3 that uses the same phrases of singing and speaking. It says this. Let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. Singing and making melody and teaching one another. So the idea of being influenced by the Spirit is that I, that I have the mindset of the Spirit. I'm sowing to the Spirit. I'm, I'm in the Word. I'm, I'm, I'm around other Christians. I'm fellowshipping. I'm I'm thinking about spiritual things and about the things of Christ, praying as the Spirit is producing in me the life of God. And notice there will be four results of this. Number one, he says, you'll speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It's interesting, there's sort of like different directions. Christians, when we sing together, it's, it's vertical, we're singing to the Lord, but it's also horizontal. Look, he says, we're... We're speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And then it's very personal. I'm singing and making melody with my heart to the Lord. In other words, it's genuine. I'm not just drawing near with the lips. And then there's a sense of gratitude, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, there's a spirit of submission, and I'm being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So next week, we're going to talk about that and about particularly in the realm of marriage. Because he's setting us up to say, part of a spirit-influenced person is that they, they understand relationships and they, and they know how to be submissive in those relationships. So as we close this morning, I called Benjamin this week. I said, listen, if that's what we're supposed to be doing, then we can't just stop. Let's practice this. Let's pray together. And then Benjamin's going to lead us if we're speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and we're, and we're showing our gratitude, people who are under the influence of the Spirit are doing what? We're discipling one another. That's what we're doing. We're advancing the gospel, making disciples. Part of how we do that is by singing and talking about the psalms together, encouraging one another. So let me close in prayer, but I especially want to ask you to do this.
in redeeming the time. Let's all commit to spending more time in prayer this year, corporately and individually. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. May we use our time wisely, especially in investing in unbelievers and family. May we make your will our priority, learning what pleases you. And may we be under the influence of the Spirit of God, be filled with the life of Jesus. And may it even be manifested as we worship and sing and teach and speak with gratitude to God. So may this closing song be an expression of the worship of our hearts. Forgive us for all the ways that we fall short. Thank you for the blood of Jesus and the hope of the gospel. May your spirit even influence us to sing from our heart. We pray in Jesus' name. And thank you for Brother Benjamin who leads us and points us to Christ. Amen. Let's stand and sing. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from every fear of those who look on him are radiant they'll never be ashamed they'll never be ashamed this poor man cried and the lord heard me and saved me from my enemy the son of god surrounds his saints he will deliver them he will deliver them magnify the lord with me come exalt the strength together glorify the lord with me all to stay forever. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, blessed is he who hides in here. Oh, fear the Lord. For all you say, He'll give you everything. He'll give you everything. Magnify the Lord with me. Come and soul to stay. me. Come exalt his name forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen. God bless you.